Well, good, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Wisner, and I am with the University of Wyoming, Laramie County Extension Office. And my program is on vegetable gardening and how to get the most out of your garden. And I'm going to share my screen with you here. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a diversion. And then I'm gonna start my PowerPoint program and we will discuss how to get the most out of your vegetable garden. Sorry about that, didn't realize it was all the way at the end. Anyway, so here we go, getting the most production from your vegetable garden or <laughs> more is never enough. So the Wyoming growing season is relatively short. I've gone through a growing season as short as 89 days and I've gone through a growing season that was long as 140 days. But on average and in general, expect anywhere from 90 to 120 growing days for your vegetable garden. And that's not a lot of time. That's actually a pretty short season. So you've got to choose wisely the plants that you put in your garden. We also are always in a drought. Some years are better than others and some are worse. But our average moisture is anywhere from nine to 15 inches. That's not a lot of water. You cannot rely on what's going to fall out of the sky to water your vegetable garden. So you have to supplement watering your garden. Our frost varies from one part of Wyoming to the other, but on the average figure about the middle to the latter part of May, and then the first frost figure towards the end of September. Our average highs during the growing season, May around 65, June 74, July, 84 degrees, the average, August, 82, September, around 73. So it's never really a hot growing season. This last summer was kind of an exception to that. Our nights are cool, and the cool nights really do have an impact on the vegetables and how they grow. So where to plant? Look around your property and, and find a location that's preferably on the east side so that you get morning sun. And morning sun for vegetable garden is incredibly important. It warms those plants up, it gets them functioning, it gets the dew off, it gets them started. And you'll have more production with a good sunny east location than you will with a west location where it gets hot and they don't warm up right away. So the east side of a building or part of the property is much better goes without saying, the soil should be well drained. You don't want puddles. It's <laughs> kind of, it's, vegetables aren't drought tolerant, but they also don't want to be um, swimming. Protect it from the wind if you can, or if you need to make a wind barrier, that's always um, helpful to them. And convenience of location. If your garden is at the backside of the North 40, you are not going to pay much attention to it come late July and August, it's gonna get on the forget. So the closer it is to where you come in and out of the house, the back door, the front door, wherever, it, the convenience of location is also really critical because it's it's gotta be there so that it reminds you that it needs to be watered and weeded. And then the size of your garden should match your time. I have a tendency to have giant gardens 4,000 square foot gardens. And, and so sometimes my time doesn't match my garden size, but have a garden that matches your time. And maybe it's, it's 20 by 10, maybe it's, maybe it's 20 by 30, but you know, measure it out and figure out if, if it's the right size garden to match the time that you have available. And of course, in a perfect gardening world, you would have a sandy loam soil. And so that sandy loam soil is easy to work. It's got good tilth. Tilth means that it can grow things. It's a fertile soil. You only wanna work the soil when it's dry. You never wanna work the soil when it's wet. And, and I know come March, it's warm out and, and it's like, I don't wanna get into the garden and I wanna get going. The soil's wet. And so I have to, I have to restrain myself and say, no, I gotta let the soil dry out before I can get in there and work it. 
if you work the soil when it's wet, you'll cause a net loss of your organic material and you'll cause soil compaction. So wait till it dries out. Vegetable gardens like a lower pH soil. So if seven is neutral, they like to have their soil right around six and a half to six. There's a few vegetables that like it even lower than that. But as a rule, you want a more acidic soil and not one that's got a higher pH. So you've got to be very careful with what you amend your soil with. And watering has got to be very, very consistent. It should be the same time of day and get on a schedule like every other day. Vegetables are not drought tolerant, so they need to have consistent watering. Fertilizer, not Fertilizer is not a one size fits all in a vegetable garden. And so you've got to keep those numbers fairly low. Otherwise you will end up with insect problems. Weeds, weeds are thieves and they will steal the moisture. They'll steal the nutrients in the soil. They harbor insects and diseases. And so weeds really are quite the villains in the vegetable garden. And then you wanna mulch. Mulching helps suppress those weeds. And, and helps keep that, that weed pressure down and it makes your life a lot easier too. And of course, sun, I, I always try to go for that east sun, that morning sun. So my vegetable garden is on the east side of my property, east side of the house. And so we're also gonna moth, <laughs> do some myth busting, bust some myths. And sometimes you'll see on a seed packet, it says you need to heal, heal some vegetables. That's based on some of the back east principles and techniques where you flood irrigate the whole vegetable garden and you don't want to rot out those seeds or you get a lot of rain and, and those seeds risk rotting. <laughs> it's not a problem back here. So hilling is really an unnecessary exercise. And then the planting depth is the length of the seed. You know, some seeds actually like to be on the surface and germinate and they need the sun to germinate which is kind of odd but um, dill weed is one that, that prefers uh, some sun and so the depth is maybe a fourth of an inch but that doesn't necessarily re represent the size of the seed all depends on what you're planting read that seed packet temperature of the soil doesn't matter temperature of the soil is actually really critical and there are some that will not grow in a cold or cool soil so that temperature is really important. And I've also seen add fertilizer in with a seed. Uh, it's a good way to destroy that little seed. They're really, when that root comes out, they're really sensitive to fertilizers. And sometimes that fertilizer can be toxic and kill off that seed. So I don't ever fertilize, put fertilizer, especially commercial fertilizer in with my seeds uh, when I plant them in the ground. Vegetables are not drought tolerant. Never. They're thirsty, thirsty, thirsty. They, uh, they want a lot of water and very consistent watering. Epsom salts. <laughs> Epsom salts is not uh, a cure for blossom end rot, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's a, it's a source of magnesium. There's no calcium in there. It, does, it actually can tie up the calcium in the soil. So Epsom salts is, is a kind of a weird myth. And then manure. More manure is better. Now, so I'm gonna get on my soapbox on manure. And the problem with manures is the salts can be very, very high. And so when people say, well, manure is hot, <clears throat> what does that mean manure is hot? It's really referring to the salts because the nitrogen is fairly low in most manures, but that salts can be really, really high. And that can be what makes it hot. <laughs> And, and the salts can cause what we refer to as physiological drought of the plant. And it, it's where it pulls the water away from the roots and it causes that plant to um, turn the lower leaves to turn yellow, causes it to wilt, get droopy, underperform, and, and, and it just sometimes outright die. And so too much manure can actually be very, very toxic in the soil. And when you think about that manure pile, and you keep putting more on top, unless you're turning it, that bottom layer is going to be extremely high in salts. And that's, that's when we move manure for the sheep, um, we clean the pens, my husband puts the bucket down there, and that is, that is the greatest concentration of salts right there. 
And again, it can be high enough that it can be toxic to your vegetables. You don't know what kind of pathogens are in there. There can be stuff in there that's harmful to you and harmful to growing your vegetables. So you wanna be very, very careful with manure. A little, a little goes a long, long ways and, and more is never enough. Um, more is too much in a vegetable garden. So don't, don't fall into that one. And a lot of your manures can be extremely high in weed seeds. Horse manure is notorious for weed seeds. And horses just are not very good processors of their food. And so that just all passes right through. And so you are planting those weed seeds in their perfect, happy environment. Lots of, a lot of good organic material and moisture and away they're, they're off and running. And you're just not gonna ever catch up to that one. There is a really good publication out on uh, dealing with alkaline soils in Wyoming, which is what most of Wyoming soils are. They're very high pH. It was written by Dr. Jane Norton at University of Wyoming. And it's a free, it's a free publication. You just go to that website and, uh, and uh, you can download it or print it but that'll help you out a lot with soils in Wyoming. I wanna invite the pollinators. God, these guys are critical to your garden success. Vegetable crop depends on these guys coming in and pollinating your, your vegetables. If you're growing any squash, there's a little tiny bee called the squash bee. A lot of people mistake it for a bad bug and get, get the seven out and kill it. And you're just, damaging your crop by doing that. So refrain from using any insecticides in your vegetable garden. It's rare, 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 rare that you even need it. If you do need to use insecticides and you call one of us, the first thing we're gonna ask you is, what have you mended the soil with and what are you fertilizing with? So you wanna be very careful. You don't wanna kill the good guys. You've got a lot of crops, tomatoes especially, that really rely on bumblebees especially to pollinate them. So some of these little, little insects are specialists to only just a couple crops. So be very careful with uh, what you do in there. So this is just a quick review on, on those numbers that are on fertilizer bags. And it's kind of, it can be those mystery numbers. You know, you see 10, 25, 10, 10, 10, 20, whatever. So the numbers can be all over the place. And, and so what does that all mean? <laughs> and, because there's never any information that's meaningful on the, on the bag or the box until you turn it over and you look at the ingredient list. And, and so if you get past all the marketing stuff on there and you go to that, um, it'll tell you a whole bunch about what's actually inside that bag of fertilizer you're buying. So the first number is always nitrogen, and nitrogen is necessary for many plant functions. It's really what tells that plant to grow, and to grow a lot, but it doesn't necessarily tell the roots to keep up with that plant, and too much nitrogen makes that, that plant soft and succulent, sweet and inviting tender and juicy. And so the bugs are gonna come in in droves and that's where you're gonna see an increase in, in aphids because there's too much nitrogen in that plant and it's just, just an insect's inviter. The middle number, the second number, phosphorus, is what tells a plant to put down good roots, to flower and to set fruit. So this is a number that is a gardener's best friend is phosphorus. And so this is the one we need a little bit higher. This is also um, a nutrient that just sort of sits in the soil. It doesn't move or nitrogen will move um, with water. So this is one that you apply early in the season and then it breaks down over time. And then the third number is potassium. And that's for vegetable gardeners, that's actually another important one. You don't need a lot of it, but it does put on the color uh, in your tomatoes. It helps with, um, for lawns, it helps with drought and uh, heat tolerance. So it's actually an important nutrient, but it's, it's tiny, you don't need a lot. And Wyoming soils are kind of naturally high in this one. 
So if you don't know what your soil is in your vegetable garden, I would encourage you to get a soil test. And it's fairly inexpensive. There's a lot of labs. I, would, I do encourage you to get a soil test that's from a lab that's close or um, a mountain state lab, someone that knows or soils. You don't wanna send the soil test out back east because they're not as familiar with the Western soils and your answers aren't going to be correct. So make sure the lab is familiar with Western soils. It should be a Western lab. Colorado State University is where we've been sending all ours. And, and again, they should know, should know our soils. So different vegetable types. So this comes down to the right plant in the right place. And there's a whole group of vegetables that like it cool. They like the cooler spring weather. They like the cooler soils. They'll actually germinate in 45 degree soils. They don't necessarily do well when it gets hot out. They can be hardy and withstand a bit of frost. They can be planted well ahead of the last frost of the season. <coughs> and they can be grown in the shade which for some places, um, being able to grow in the shade is important. So who are these guys? Well, broccoli, kale, peas. Peas are very well known for planting those guys in March and, and getting a very early crop with them. Radishes, kohlrabi, cabbage, leeks. Um, I'll plant my leeks and my onions in, uh, April, in uh, March and they'll get snowed on, They're, they just do fine, and get to harvest early. So there's a whole group that like it early, do well in cool soils, do well in shade. All your salad greens will do well in shade. Um, cabbage, cabbage is a fun one to grow. You can cut that, you know, grow a big cabbage head and then cut it, leave, leave the stump, leave the roots and everything there. And it will sprout up little little mini cabbages that are kind of like the personal size eating ones, like one pound cabbages. So it's, they're kind of cute and they're very tasty. You can eat your vegetables. So vegetable types can also be half hardy. And these are the guys that kind of, they don't really care a lot about what the soil temperature is. Beets, carrots, celery, parsnips, potatoes, Brussels sprouts, chard, um, rutabagas. So I'll plant uh, my beets and my carrots early, like um, April, and along with the potatoes. And it does take the carrots a little longer to germinate. They just fine in there, and so do the beets. And the beets I found taste better, for all of you who like beets, <laughs> they taste a lot better when they're grown in cooler soil. So their flavor actually improves with cooler soil and decreases with the soil when it gets too warm. Warm season. These are plants that like to have their roots warm. And when I say warm, um, 85 degrees. And I will actually take the temperature of the soil and I use a meat thermometer and just poke it into the ground and take the temperature of the soil so I know exactly what I'm dealing with. <clears throat> These guys aren't frost tolerant. They like the soil 65 degrees or warmer. In the summer, 85 degrees is what I found that they really, really like. So it's hard in Wyoming to get soil that's 85 degrees. 65 degrees soil temperature is kind of the norm. So there's some ways to get around that and to encourage that soil to heat up. So the guy, the uh, vegetables who like it warm, they're cucumbers, squash, eggplants, sweet potatoes, watermelon, muskmelon, peppers, sweet corn, tomatoes, okra, peppers, sweet potatoes, and peanuts. Now, <laughs> you can grow okra in Wyoming. So if all of you who are from the South or like okra, it does grow here, it grows very well here. And I found that it's about 55 days from when I put the seed in the ground to when harvesting, so it's a very short season, so you'll definitely get a crop. And I found that you really have to stay on top of picking those guys because they're, they're fast. Um, I've grown sweet potatoes here. I've gotten meaningful size sweet potatoes. In other words, like a pound, a pound and a half size sweet potatoes. 
And every year, just for the fun of it, I grow peanuts. I, I don't get a crop, much of a crop, and I'm certainly not a threat to anybody down in Georgia. But you can grow peanuts here in Wyoming, and it's a very fun crop to do with, with kids. So mid-season, it's never too late to think about planting a little bit more. So it's 1st of July. Again, go ahead and, you know, if you've got stuff that has already played out, you can pull those and, and reseed, replant most of your salad greens, spinach, carrots, beets, sugar snap peas, turnips, winter squash, radishes um, for, you know, a late crop or even a second crop. So it's, even if you get a late start into the vegetable garden, you can still get something out of it. Even in September, I've planted more salad greens. I've planted potatoes in September and harvested them at Christmas. So that was a very, that was a very fun adventure. So watering your garden. This is, this is really another area that's gonna make or break your garden is how you're watering it. If you're using an overhead sprinkler system and you're throwing the water up and around, all you're doing is encouraging weeds. You're putting the water on top of the plant. It then has to run off and get to the roots. So now you're going to have um, less water at the roots than what the plant needs. The plant needs a lot more than what's dripping down there. If you're running so much water that now you've got puddles, you're, you're losing the oxygen in your soil. And that's not a good thing. And, and just, just hot and dry Wyoming in the summer, and you're throwing that water up and around, you know, you're losing anywhere from 40 to 60% of that moisture. That water's just going away someplace else. So you want to keep your water on the ground. And this is what that looks like. I like to use drip tape. And this is, this is the drip tape right here. It lasts longer. It's easier to use. It, for me, it's easier to store. And, but the soaker hose has got some, quite a few advantages to it also, and that it's, it's easy to put together, it's easy to, um, it, make, it goes around, does circles, does curves, drip tape doesn't do that. So soaker hose is a good way to get started with this, but the, the important thing with watering is to put it on the ground at the roots where the plant needs it. So this area here that's wet, if your plants, or in this area, you're watering the roots and not the leaves, and you're not watering or encouraging weeds in this area. And you can plant tighter, you can plant more in an area where you're using drip or soaker hose, so you can get more in a smaller area and get a bigger crop. So the watering being consistent is huge. So this is drip tape, or excuse me, this is soaker hose, and this is what it looks like on the ground. And again, it, you can curve it, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with it. But I always put the soaker hose or the drip tape down first. This goes down first. And then I come in with some black plastic and I lay the black plastic down on top of it. And so for your, your warm season vegetables, like your tomatoes and your peppers, your green beans, your cucumbers, all those guys, eggplants, okra, they like hot soil. And again, just these are fairly inexpensive, these little meat thermometers. And, and they help, they're a, they're a fun tool to have in the garden and to know exactly what that temperature is. And again, I know it's black plastic, but think, you know, these guys want their soil hot. They want those roots hot. And the the states that are really big and growing tomatoes are, are hot states, Southern California, Texas, Georgia, you know, they all have soil that gets to this temperature without the need for black plastic, although they do use a lot of black plastic just to help suppress weeds. So I dig a trench because otherwise this is going to blow away in the wind, right? So I dig a trench and, and then I tuck the corners, the sides of the black plastic into that trench and I backfill the soil on top of it so that the soil is holding the black plastic in place. And so it looks like that. So it's all tucked in. Soil's gonna stay hot. Tomatoes are gonna be happy. Peppers are gonna be happy. 
And then I come in with mulch and I mulch in these areas between the black plastic because I don't want to weed. I have better things to do in my summer than spend weeding. So the mulch, the, this is just old straw, and that is what's going to suppress the weeds or, or the majority of the weeds. And I might spend maybe 10, 15 minutes weeding in this sort of system. Warm soil, suppress the weeds, irrigation underneath that black plastic. And that is going to just right there make a huge difference. But again, your vegetables want to be watered consistently, and especially tomatoes. They want to be watered at the same time every day or every other day. They, they, don't, they don't want, oh, I've forgotten, and you water them you know, four days later. They won't reward you very well. So you really want to water your, your vegetables, all of them, the whole garden, about mid-morning when it, the temperatures have warmed up and those plants have warmed up. They'll, again, they'll do, you'll get a better crop and you won't get ugly fruits like you do if you early, early in the morning. So water when it's warm out or warmer part of the day, late afternoon is fine too. It's just that watering at six in the morning really doesn't help the garden at all. And again, vegetables aren't drought tolerant. So timers are your best friend and they're your best employee in the vegetable garden and perennials or annuals, whatever, whatever part of your garden, your trees, the whole, the whole garden, this is, these are your best friends, your best employees. But off for the weekend or you go away for a vacation and you're gone for a couple of weeks, you cannot rely on that neighbor kid <laughs> to water your garden. You're gonna come home and the garden's gonna be soaking wet and he's gonna say, yeah, I watered it. Yeah, he did once and everything's dead. So <laughs> these cost around $40, $45, a couple batteries, last you all summer. And they turn the water off, turn the water on and turn it off. And you set the days for it, it's, it'll make your life so much easier. And your garden will reward you for it. A consistently watered vegetable garden is going to just really out, outperform anything you've ever done by hand. So I want to talk about some specific vegetables. I'm going to hit the top four, tomatoes, green beans, sweet corn, and potatoes. So tomatoes, love growing tomatoes, 3,000 varieties. You know, I'll never have enough time to grow them all. They come in every color under the rainbow. And if you haven't had some of these colored ones, I forgot to put the color purple in there because there's purple, there's purple tomatoes. They are wonderful. The flavor is just can be just off the chart, especially with your yellow ones. Um, there's a yellow and red striped one. The flavor is just fabulous. Um, heirlooms, hybrids, choices are huge. Cherries, grapes, salads, sandwich tomatoes, paste tomatoes, beefsteak tomatoes. It, it's just it's, it's a huge choice, and I would encourage you to go through the seed catalogs. And, and grow and start your tomatoes from seed instead of um, picking up tomato plants at the store. You'll have a greater variety, a greater choice of what to grow. And, and the flavor profiles of all these tomatoes can be different. And so it's just fun to try the different, different flavors. So a word on beefsteak tomatoes. Everybody likes that giant fills the whole sandwich, loaf of bread, or you know, slice of bread size. They can take 110 days to grow before you can harvest them. And so that is a, that exceeds our growing season for the most part. And you'll end up hauling green tomatoes, giant green tomatoes into the house at the end of the growing season and then they taste awful. Stick with smaller ones, stick with tomatoes that are gonna be about 10 ounces, eight ounces. Cherry, grape, salad tomatoes are going to be just abundance, lots and lots of those guys. But your beef steaks are not going to reward you in Wyoming unless you have a greenhouse or a high tunnel. And even then, when I was growing these in my high tunnel, I would it would still be late August before I could pick a big ripe pound and a half 
beef steak tomato. So they just need a very, very long growing season. Tomatoes also come as indeterminate or determinate. And indeterminate means that they will grow and grow and grow until something tells them to stop growing, like your pruners <laughs> or frost. But otherwise, I've had indeterminate tomatoes get uh, 16 feet long. That's huge. Those are, those are your cherry tomatoes. They'll just keep on growing. Determinate ones, these are the more well-behaved, neat and tidy. They do well in containers. They're only gonna get maybe, well, there's some that are, are as small as 18 inches tall, and there's some that get as big as three feet tall. So the size varies. And if you're growing in a container, these are great for containers. Growing season can be as short as 50 days for harvest. Um, so from the time, theoretically, <laughs> from the time you plant that tomato to the time you get a first fruit, fruit is 50 days. Um, I found that it's usually a lot longer in Wyoming because our nights are so cool and they need warmer nights in order to um, get that red tomato, get that ripe tomato. 110 days, those are your beef steaks, your bigger, your bigger tomatoes. Again, you're not going to get very well rewarded with it. You really want to have something that's going to have a days to maturity or days to harvest number that's going to be small. The smaller the number, the better, and the more likely you're going to get a good crop. Again, these are warm season plants. They want hot soil. Put the black plastic down, put the irrigation under the black plastic. That makes them happy. That makes them really, really happy to have very warm soil. Fertilizer, you want to keep that first number low. Avoid the uh, temptation to buy miracle Grow tomato because it's 18% nitrogen. You will have a huge tomato. You'll have, you'll have the best looking tomato on the block. It'll be just huge and lush and, and the foliage will be amazing, but you're not going to get much fruit on it because that plant's just putting too much energy into growing and not enough into putting on fruit. So be very careful with your fertilizer. And that first number should be small, very small number. So skip the miracle Grow. If you've got miracle Grow, go put it on your petunias, use it on your lawn, <laughs> but keep it out of your vegetable garden. Again, drip irrigation is best for tomatoes, soaker hose, but uh, it, they're not drought tolerant. So they do need, to, they wanna be on a schedule. I think I've said that several times, haven't I? So tomatoes do some funny things. Sometimes they'll drop their blossoms. You'll come out and the blossoms will be nice and yellow and all of a sudden the next day they'll be kind of white, then they turn brown and fall off. So this is a temperature fluctuation that causes this. And so this can happen in the spring when temperatures warm up but night temperatures get really cool out. You know, I've seen, I've seen night temperatures here drop back down into 45 degrees. And then all of a sudden we'll get into summer and we'll get some hot days and temperature will drop, you know, jump all the way up to 90 degrees and then night temperatures swing back cold. Tomatoes and peppers both will drop their blossoms. If there's nothing you can do about it, not a thing you can do about it. So that does happen. Blossom end rot and Epsom salts. Epsom salts doesn't do anything for blossom end rot. It's really the plant's inability to take up calcium. And so calcium, the plant takes calcium up the most efficiently when the plant is growing and in a very active state of growing. So blossom and rot occurs when that plant has stopped growing, you know, putting on more leaves and upward growth, and the growth has stopped, and it's, it's not able to take up calcium as efficiently as it was when it was a young plant growing strongly. Moisture fluctuations in the soil don't help this. Cold soils don't help this problem. It, it exasperates the problem, cold soils, um, moisture fluctuations. The thing is that Wyoming soils have an abundance of calcium. So you really don't need to add calcium back into your soil. You might try, um, again, black pla growing it, black plastic irrigation underneath it and, um, and just really watching watching the soil temperatures on that. Do a soil test before you add anything to your soil. You know, don't, don't add Epsom salts or gypsum going, well, I've got blossom end rot, I gotta do something. 
um, eggshells, that's garden meth, it doesn't do anything. Get a soil test first. Again, um, you can go on to Colorado State University's website. They've got an awesome soil testing lab and that's where we send everything from um, the Cheyenne Laramie County area. We do um, an amazing job with some good information back to you that you can actually understand. Sweet corn, we're jumping ahead to sweet corn now. Over 265 varieties of sweet corn. So many to choose from. So the important thing again is that days to maturity or days to harvest. And, and so when you're in the store and if you're buying seed at the store, seed companies just sell you what they think might maybe grow here, might maybe. And a lot of times that days to maturity or harvest is way too long. I've seen them send us sweet corn varieties that have 90 day to harvest. Well, if you don't plant that corn seed until the end of May, you're, you're looking at three months down the road before you can harvest something. So corn is very soil temperature sensitive. And a lot of corn won't do well in cold soils and that's 65 degrees or colder. And a lot of corn won't do well north of, of Cheyenne. And so you've, you've got to really read that seed packet. And this is where I would encourage you to get a good quality seed catalog and read the descriptions so that you know you're getting a corn, a sweet corn that will grow in our area. So check the variety, make sure it does well in cold soils or cool soils. And again, you want that days to maturity or days to harvest that number to be small. And there is corn out there that's 65 days because you know my goal is always to be having tomatoes and sweet corn on the 4th of July. That is always my goal. I don't always make it, but I try. Fertilizer, they do like a little bit more nitrogen than some of the rest of the, the group because they are in that, that kind of that grass family. And so they want more nitrogen, not, not to the point where you're getting insect pressures. And they want water. They are thirsty, one to two inches of water per week. That is a lot of water. So it almost needs to be on a separate watering system so that they can get more. And leave the suckers on. The sweet corn I grow suckers and just leave them there. Roots are very shallow. Again, they're not drought tolerant. And then some of the problems that we see, you know, where the, the ear doesn't fill out completely, that sometimes can be um, caused by a lack of nitrogen in the soil or not enough water or both, or it could even be hot, dry, and windy. So we do need a little bit of wind to cause for pollination, but we don't need all that wind to blow, blow the pollen to the next state. So under good growing conditions, an ear of corn will form for harvest 20 days after the silk is showing. So when you first start to see that silk popping up, that's where you start looking at the calendar and you go, oh, three weeks from now, I'm gonna be picking sweet corn. So mark it on your calendar, write it down on your dry erase board, whatever, and just, just watch it. And, and then go out and check it and take a peek at it. I always just peel it back a little bit and take a peek and put it back together. And uh, so I, I, cause I want tender sweet corn. I don't want it starchy and tacky. Green beans. Green beans are a lot of fun to grow. And again, 1,500 different varieties, hard and snap. Very sensitive to high salts. So this goes back to my manure soapbox. And just be careful. If you, if you insist on putting manure in your vegetable garden, and I encourage you not to, um, green beans and manures don't get along at all. They have a very shallow root season, very susceptible to drought. So again, keep them on a, a drip or a soaker hose system where they're getting consistent water on a timer. Um, and then I always, you know, at the bottom here, I talk about a soil inoculant. And a soil inoculant is a, is a rhizobium that you dust the seed with. And you can either put the inoculant in the trough, you know, you put a little trough down when you plant your seeds, I always take a screwdriver and just you know, plow a little furrow there. 
and then I'll put my inoculant in there and then I plant my seeds. And that inoculant is important because it helps that, that little green bean seed root <laughs> to take up nitrogen. And without that helper, that rhizobium inoculant helper, it is very, very inefficient at taking up nitrogen. And so your, your green beans, the leaves will be kind of a, a light or pale green. They'll be even a yellowish lime colored green on the leaves. And that's just a sign that they're not taking up enough nitrogen. And even if you go in there with a nitrogen fertilizer, it, they need that, that, that inoculant on the roots to take that nitrogen up. And so um, it's the same thing with some of the other major crops that are planted like alfalfa, um, any of the hard beans, always they're done with an inoculant so that they can take up that nitrogen. And when you buy your seed, again, I would encourage you to go through a seed catalog and that inoculant is usually sold by seed companies. It's a very um, fragile product and it needs to be kept in your refrigerator. So just before you, when you get it, when you order it with your green beans, put it in your refrigerator and, and then only take it out when you're going to actually start planting your green beans or your, your peas or whatever you're gonna be planting. Peas also need this inoculant. And don't, you don't want to leave it out in the sun. You don't want to leave it in the car or out in the garden because that sun will kill it. The heat will kill it. So fragile. Uh, you're not going to find it in the grocery stores or those places, hardware stores. Potatoes. I love growing potatoes. Um, again, just a huge amount of varieties to grow. But one of the things I hear a lot is that, well, I planted potatoes, but I only got a couple. And they look like rocks. <laughs> Maybe they were rocks. I don't know. Um, but I hear a lot from people that say, you know, I just don't ever have success with potatoes. So, so here's, here's how you grow potatoes. And here's how you're going to get a big crop. This, you always want to dig a trough. And you want to plant these potatoes down in a trough. You can, you can plant potatoes in a, in a bin. You can plant them in a black plastic bag. I, Tires, skip the tires, the tires are nasty and tires leach a lot of nasty stuff and you don't wanna eat that. So just skip the whole tire thing, that's icky. Um, wire, you can make a wire basket, um, chicken wire basket, line it. You can grow potatoes in leaves and you can grow them in peat moss practically and they're pretty forgiving, but they're not forgiving on a couple of things. So I just grow mine in a big trench I start them early. I'll actually start them in the house. I'll put out um, a tray, a planting tray and some soil in it. I'll cut them, put them in there. I'll get them growing. And in this picture here, you can see they're growing there and I planted them in the soil. I've got little hills on them already. And I've got my mound of soil here. And as they grow, I will bury them. But before I do that, I put, if you look over in this picture here, I have put my drip tape down and I want the drip tape right at the roots. And so in this picture up here, you can see the roots. There's the seed potato right there. There's the roots and they've started to grow foliage. If you water from the top, sprinkler system, and you're watering from the top, you're never going to get that water to the roots that need the that need it, and so your soaker hose. You can bury your soaker hose. I bury my drip tape. I've got another trench here that I'm setting up, and I'll be planting potatoes down in there. And then as they grow, I just mound it up, and I just keep burying the foliage, and and I and I practically bury it, and it's just barely peeking out of the soil. So I'll have a huge mound of soil covering my potatoes. And I will plant them early. I'll plant them um, April. I'll plant them in the middle of April. And they're in the soil, they're buried, they're fine. And they've been snowed on. This was 
first of June, they got hailed on. And so you can see this first of June, how tall they are. They're already 18 inches above the ground. They're doing great. I just keep mounding more soil up around them. Even if I have to kind of borrow some soil, I just keep burying them deeper. And I will also, in this trench, I will put alfalfa pellets. Just plain go to the go to the feed store, 50 pound sack of alfalfa pellets, and, and I will put, I'll just kind of sprinkle the alfalfa pellets in that trench. And so as as a as they get watered, that alfalfa breaks down and makes an alfalfa tea with very, very low nitrogen, maybe one or two percent, or not much there. Um, I have put some other soil amendments in there, but again, my nitrogen is very, very low. If again, if these guys get too much nitrogen, you'll have giant plants and no potatoes. So your fertilizer in a vegetable garden is, is critical, is really important, as is your watering. So I've got my drip, you can see, I sort of see the drip tape right there. House storm, they withstood the house storm just perfect. That was kind of not expected, but um, they did well. And then I harvested those three rows. They're 60 feet long. <laughs> I like growing potatoes, I have no idea what I'm gonna do with all these potatoes, but I grew 500 pounds of potatoes. And so my, um, my fork here gives you an idea of the size of some of these. These are all purple Vikings. This is the, uh, this is a pound, well over a pound and a half potato. And my goal is someday to grow the two pound potato. This is also kind of interesting right here on this potato and that it has scab and these little bumps with little warts on it. It's cosmetic, doesn't hurt the potato, doesn't affect the flavor, but it is a bacteria that's in the soil that causes these little scabs. So potatoes are actually very easy to grow. Water is critical, your fertilizer is critical and, and you will be rewarded. They should be giving you back 10 pounds of potatoes minimum for every pound that you planted. And I've got about six, you know, I've got about 50 pounds planted in here and I got 500 pounds back. So I, I hit the benchmark on that. So here's to a great growing season and success for everybody all the way around. And thank you for your time.